What's up and welcome back to the kind of funny games cast. Of course, I'm Tim Geddes and I'm joined by the new face of video games. Blessing at Yoye Jr. What's up, Timmy Bobby? Oh, Timmy Bobby. I love it. So do you hear about this, Greg? No. You got uh, a new course, name, the, Timmy Bobby? We got the big daddy, Greg Miller. How you doing? Great, Timmy Bobby. Uh, yeah, when, when I was little, starting when I was little, and you hear it every once in a while, Kevin will call me Tim Bob because my name's Timothy Robert Geddes, which sure, Blessing sure. thought you just made up as a name for me. He didn't know that was my real name until he saw sure. my driver's license at the airport and he was blown away. And uh, Kevin was like, yeah, I, I actually call him Timmy Bobby all the time. And it's like, no, you don't, Kevin. <laughs> you fucking liar. Now but we now, 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 now we do. Now, now, we, now we're so, calling you Timmy it's, Bobby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Timmy Bobby, baby. Easily. How do you feel about that Texas treat, Latino heat? Clicking heads and ripping them to shreds. The globe trotting, head shotting, nitro rifle from twitch.tv. Andy Cortez. Sounds like y'all had a lot of fun over there. We you did, come, Andy. Andy. We did, Andy. Where are you and at? I want you to know. I want you to know, Andy. I personally thought about you multiple times, wishing that you were there because I think you would have had a really, really good time. But yeah, we, we uh, had our own fun here, you know. We had our yeah, own that's fun cool. Uh -huh. I, w uh -huh. I will say, yeah, like, you, you might have. So and you might have been sad to see us do our thing in LA. I was sad when I saw you guys doing your thing here. I was like, man, I, I wish I was there. I want to be where the people are. You yeah. could have, you could have experienced Nick trying to be a wingman at a bar. Um, but yeah, you're glad, you're, you should be glad you didn't have to witness that. So. <laughs> and I am glad I didn't have to witness that because this is the year of our Lord 2022. Of course, I'm Tim Geddes again. We went through all this stuff. This is the kind of funny games cast. I am off today and I apologize for that. But we as a group are about to put on a fire ass show because we just played an insane amount of video games at Summer Game Fest. We're going to talk about all of them. Of course, we do the show each and every week. You can watch it on youtube.com slash kind of funny games or roosterteeth.com. You can also get it as a podcast by searching your favorite podcast service for kind of funny games cast and we'll be right there for you if you wanted to watch live as we record it if you want the exclusive post show and if you want to get the show ad free you got to go to patreon.com slash kind of funny games just like our patreon producers gordon mcguire fargo brady tyler ross delaney twinning first responder nd olive party julian the gluten-free gamer alex j sandoval casey andrew and james hastings have all done uh if you do not have bucks to toss our way that's totally cool anytime you're on the epic game store use our epic creator code kind of funny and it'll send some of those dollars to us at no additional cost to you so it's really cool and it helps us do a whole bunch of cool things including pay a whole bunch of editors to make dope ass TikToks that you can get all over our kind of funny games TikTok. Roger and the team have been doing a, a ton of previews on the games that we've been playing. So as some additive content, everything you're about to hear here, if you want to get a little tight, fun thing, you can go to TikToks kind of funny games and see a whole bunch of our previews there. Um, and then on top of that, we did a spoiler free review of the quarry last week and a spoiler filled spoiler cast of the quarry that you can check out now on the games cast podcast feeds youtube channels everything i just went over earlier so that's all great today we're brought to you by shopify and athletic greens but i'll get to that later uh final thing i want to say housekeeping wise is if you've ever been a fan of kind of funny right now is a fantastic time for you on both the kind of funny and kind of funny game sides if it, it it's been a while since you've clicked around the channels. I highly recommend it. There is so much dope content going up, so please check it all out. But without further ado, we got to start this off right, Bless. Me and you have been holding on to this information for so long. The last couple days, we have played Sonic Frontiers, everybody. And now we get to talk about it. Blessing, Andy, what, I do, saw you him do, it. what Tim, do you think about Sonic Frontiers? I, I, I want you to lay the land on everything going on around sonic frontiers like in terms not in, not in terms of like the what the world stuff was what we experienced at summer game fest in terms of like what the plan was how chaotic it was not like and you can only talk about so, so many things but if you can provide some some context to it because i feel like it is also very like uh, i feel like it paints a picture of what our time with sonic frontiers was yeah so the big top level thing i want to say is jeff Keeley threw an incredible event here for summer games fest this is one of the, him partnering up with i am, I am 8 bit greg you've been doing this a very long time at this point i've been doing this a very long time this sure. is one of the, the the best venues i've ever had for game demos just the the amount of games that were there sure there wasn't that many big triple a stuff but there was a couple heavy hitters a ton of amazing indie games ton of great people it was just good vibes all around everything was kind of just available for you to play any which way you wanted to with rare exceptions sonic being one of those exceptions if you wanted to play 
played Sonic Frontiers, I swear to God, they made you do a whole freaking obstacle course to be able to play it. <laughs> so unfortunately, I wasn't able to play as much as I would have liked. I think, Bless, same for you. We yeah. went in there super excited. We thought that all three of us were going to get a sizable amount of time with the game, and we ended up getting severely circumcised on, on that time. Uh, so Bless and I kind of had to split Half of the time, we thought all of us were going to get individually with it. Uh, so that is kind of like the the top level with with all of that. Um, yeah. And on top of that, they they were the only group there that had embargoed information uh, for the game. Everyone else was like, oh, yeah, cover, r- record whatever you want, put it up and, and go for it. Sonic was like, yeah, you can't shoot off screen anything. You can't talk about <laughs> xyz till the date, sonic whatever. at the my, event <laughs> oh dude it was it was my, yeah my, like, fa- my, my favorite thing about it was like there was a point early on where they moved bushes mm-hmm. that were like or there, there were like plants that were around the event right they moved plants to like block certain fields of view so people wouldn't be able to take footage of the game well no that. yeah it yes and no it's just like it was the most nonsensical thing because i'm sure ladies and gentlemen you've seen someone's coverage whether it was ours whether it was a photo whether it was andrea's whether it was jeff Keeley's, of this giant open air space with all these different pods and all these different screens so that is awesome and great and then a fucking nightmare if you decided to put two embargoes into your game because like clearly if you're taking a photo with a friend at the bar in the background is sonic fucking frontier they didn't you know you you don't even have an appointment to go sign it you didn't even go sign an nda you didn't go play it you're not you know nothing about this you're gonna take a photo anywhere you're gonna get this fucking game so yeah when we went over there, we find out all the stuff. He started and he's like, oh my God. And then people would be tweeting about the stuff we're embargoed from saying because they didn't, they were just watching. You can walk by any of these booths and look into what's happening. And then, yeah, you're taking the photo. Then they moved all these shrubs over to block one very specific angle. Even right there. Look to the, look to the top left. There's Sonic. Oh, yeah, no! You can see it's oh, just no! a splash right screen. Just the splash screen. But you can imagine every other person's photos or videos or the walkthrough or the Twitch streamers with those. uh, They were doing the robot, tele the iPads getting rolled around stuff. God. Nightmare. It was the most Sonic the Hedgehog thing to ever happen. Uh, exactly. And so that's yeah. the thing. It set the tone for what we were expecting. And, you know, everyone out there understands. Me and Bless are Sonic fans. For better or worse, we understand what this shit is. So this whole experience, it added to it. It added to the insanity yeah. of it all. Because we played it and so did hundreds of other people. And, Bless, you keep saying this. But but what surprises you most about Sonic Frontiers in terms of people's opinions? I... <laughs> I asked so many people who got to get hands on with Sonic Frontiers what they thought of it. Nobody could give me the same answer. Everybody landed <laughs> on a different place. Some people were like, that was fantastic. I talked to quite a few people who I respect their opinion, like people who I respect their opinion dearly. I think Imran already put up his article. He was like, I, it was terrible. I fucking hated it, right? I'm somebody who I played this demo. I was looking forward to being bummed out because I, I saw the trailers that everybody else <laughs> I was looking <laughs> forward to being bummed out. I was really looking forward to, be bummed, to being bummed out by this thing because I saw the same trailers that everybody else did. And then that first trailer, right, it was that it was that initial reveal of Sonic on the, you know, Skyrim-like Breath of the Wild, like open world kill looking looking uh looking at a horizon right and us seeing the world and us go oh and i went oh man this looks this looks good this looks like something i really want to experience i hope they're able to to pull off an open world sonic game they released that second trailer which was the combat focus trailer right part of the ign first and that is where i started to lose all hope getting my hands on sonic frontiers for 30 minutes at the demo kiosk that hope has been somewhat restored. I actually had a really good time. I had a lot of fun with it. Uh, the 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 biggest fears I had with it being the combat, being how empty and how weird the open world could play. Because I think both me and Tim are on the same side of man. This game just needs to feel good. How does this game to feel uh, in in terms of running around the world, doing the doing the platforming stuff, right? Find, finding enemies, all that. Combat is actually better in, in your hand than it looks on screen. You know, I, control control scheme wise, it seems like the game is giving you two different control schemes. They have the uh, more modern, newer control scheme, which makes it play more like a character action game where it is you are pressing high R2. speed or action are the names of the two ones. Yes, and I played action, right? And so that that made it so that R two was sprint. You don't have to go fast. I don't have to go fast. No, I'm I'm pressing R two to sprint. Right, I'm pressing square to uh, do combat stuff. Right, get my combos in. X to jump, obviously. But then, like, there's also a lock on that feels almost souls like in essence. Not not a souls like, but it has that lock on system where you are like you know shifting around an enemy, jumping in, getting your attacks, dodging, countering, doing all that stuff. It plays like a character action game in a lot of the open world segments, which was something that surprised me. Like, I actually had fun running around the world. The world is. 
it's open, right? And the, the article me and Tim read today about it uh, from the director was saying that it's they're calling it open zone, uh, but it's open the way that like a, a Mario Odyssey level is open, right? We got to play in that initial, um, the first zone that you see from the trailer. And it felt very open. You can run anywhere. You could do whatever. You get you can you can get uh you know carried off by a rail or a platform or whatever grabs your attention. The world is littered with a bunch of platforming challenges to do. And I had a lot of fun with that stuff. It, re it reminded me of playing a Mario Odyssey in the way that I'd be walking around the world, see a point of interest, go, oh, what's that? Oh, it's a puzzle. Let me solve the puzzle. I solve the puzzle. I get a little heart. <laughs> Right. Or, oh, man, what does this platform thing take me up to? I, I go all the way to the top of a tower. Oh, cool. A little heart. Right. Like the game is formatted like a traditional platforming game uh, in a way that I really like, in a way that I think really works. Uh, there are some aspects of it that don't come together, at least yet in the build that we were playing. Uh, there is like weird, there was weird bug stuff. There was weird frame rate stuff. The resolution uh, was off in the build that we were playing. And I think some, some of this is the build. I'm sure some of this is just where they're at with the game, the game. as well. Um, but technically I, I, I did have more to desire. Um, that said, like I really enjoyed how it felt to play in my hands. Tim, what about you? I'm I'm pretty much right there with you. Like honestly, this it it is as strange as a paradise as you could possibly hope for from a Sonic game, where it's like it is that so bad it's good. And I think that it's working so far for me. Where I'm right there with you. First trailer, I was like, I'm interested in this combat trailer. I was like, oh no, this is gonna suck. And the two different gameplay modes, I think, kind of allow it to not suck nearly as bad as it looks like it might. Um, I played the high speed mode. Um, which is way more classic Sonic. And then uh, when I ended up having to shift over to your demo station, I got to play some of the action mode. And they were a lot different than I expected them to be. You can switch back and forth, which I think is uh, a cool function. But on top of that, we've been talking a lot about this needing to just feel right in order to scratch the itch that I'm looking for for a 3D Sonic game. And I was shocked to go into the options and see... Uh, as many sliders as there are for being able to change your acceleration, your your stop speed, your drift, your all the stuff to make it feel how you want it to. So I think they understand uh, what they need to accomplish with this from a momentum point of view for the open world stuff in particular, right? Uh, you brought up Mario Odyssey. I think that is my favorite thing about this is while it looks a lot more like Breath of the Wild, it is. It plays more like a Mario Odyssey where every single little area has something to do to achieve something and get something immediately from it. And um, it was fun. Like It was fun to move around and, and do dumb things. And the, the cutscenes you get are very, we got to go kill chaos vibes, but with Sonic and friends. And there was more than one genuine surprises where Bless and I like lost our shit. Like we're yeah. sitting next to each other with Greg behind us, like laughing at us. Like being like, oh my god! And not it's not like, only it was... laughing, writing down the quotes, the actual quotes. The one I know I can say is when Blessing took off the headset, Andy turns to Tim, hands Tim the headset, and goes, "Bro, listen to this." <laughs> and then they both nerd out about whatever the fuck was happening there. And then another thing happened that I'm pretty sure I can't, but it was a something popped up on screen, a, a, a character or whatever. And Blessing just goes, what the fuck? Like super yeah, audible in this extreme thing. Extreme deviant behavior. Like, yeah, that's yeah, no, straight up. But it's like... It, it's I would have had you all arrested on the spot, both of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's delivering the things that us deviants are kind of looking for so far, and I am surprised by that. Now, look, if you do not like... 3d sonic games if you do not like any 3d sonic games because at this point there's been a bunch of different styles of them i, I don't think that this is going to get you unless you're in it for the memes but i am happy to say that i am extremely excited to get more time with this game and i'm extremely excited to talk about other stuff that they're that they're showing off and um just with where where this game seems to to be currently uh, it makes me simultaneously more hopeful for what it could be uh, and more scared of how bad it possibly can get. But there's something exciting about that, too. This is I, this is what I'll say. This is the most hope I've had for a 3D Sonic game in maybe ever. <laughs> like, and not, not to say that this is going to come out, it's going to land, it's going to be an absolute masterpiece. But, like, I think the direction of this game is kind of brilliant in terms of how to shift a Sonic game into something that feels more natural and more uh, interesting and dynamic. You know, I think we've had the back and forth for years and years and years about Sonic games. And there are plenty of people, I think Andy Cortez, you're part of, these, you're part of this group. And I've heard you say this, and I've heard plenty of people say this, and to some extent I agree, in terms of how 3D Sonic feels to play, uh, of like the roller coasterness of it, right? Like it, it very is like, you're on a rail, you're pressing R1, R, R, R1, L1 to like shift between, you are, you know, doing the lock on shit, and then you get to the end and it's like, I, 
Like, the, Sonic is the only game that plays like that, and I like it because I just like the on rails this of Sonic, and I like the, the spectacle of it, and I, of course I have huge nostalgia for it. This direction feels more along the lines of how a platformer should be experienced in terms of exploration, in terms of puzzle solving, in terms of platforming challenges, and bringing these different elements together in a way that feels more free and dynamic in a way that Sonic games, unless, except for like a lot of the 2D ones and some of the more classic ones, modern Sonic games don't f give you a lot of player choice in terms of how you want to play. It really is, all right, see how far you can get without maybe accidentally falling off a ledge or like see how far you can get and like do the automatic lock-ons to take out enemies. There are the automatic, automatic lock-on enemies here in this game as well, but they feel like they're meant as platforms. They're the, the they have purpose in terms of getting you to a different location, right? And like, the 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 way the world is formatted feels very fun for exploration like i just enjoyed my time playing it as not even just a sonic game but also as an open world platformer and one of the things that we haven't seen from the um the previews at least to my knowledge that i was really kind of uh taken aback by and impressed by was the hud itself where in the the bottom left and bottom right of the screen on the bottom right there's an actual like speedometer like miles per hour of how fast mm -hmm. sonic is going that like is goofy when you just think about that like why would you need that but on the just left like side going fast. feel like you're going fast but on the left side there's um this kind of like four-way cross system where uh left up right and down one is shield one is attack one is rings and one is speed and each one has a level from one to 50 so it seems like you're kind of like gaining skills as you rise up and i think yeah, like, like with leveling the speed, up i think right it'll allow your top screen top speed on the the bottom right of the screen to to increase and like kind of allow you to do different things and reach different areas in an almost metroidvania type way um and that just kind of seemed like it opened up the possibilities for what this game can be beyond this one zone that we've been seeing so far in ways that i'm like that could really work because that gives you the incentives for why you're going around collecting all the mario odyssey type yeah. trinkets here and there I, and that's that's kind of like a, a fun uh reward for the, the the random bullshit you're doing and a lot of people i i've seen uh who like sonic and have seen the gameplay and are like oh what about this what about this right one of the things i see being being thrown around is the speed it seems like sonic runs slow and yeah like once i saw that of you can level up your speed you can get collectibles level up different things right like that filled me with way more confidence of where it would go and you know i i still have a lot of critique or not even just critique but i have a lot of hopes in terms of i really hope there are varied zones. I hope it isn't just this like lush green, um, foresty environment. I hope I get somewhere and it's desert. I hope I get somewhere and it's snowy, right? Like, I, and I hope they even get more creative than that. Um, I want to see some some of that stuff. That's the that's those are uh, questions that we don't have answers to from me and my and Tim's t uh, time playing. But one thing I do want to shout out is the gameplay loop. When I go over to IGN's article uh, for their hands on that they have as part of IGN first, toward the bottom of Mitchell Saltzman's uh, write up, uh, he writes this right. He talks about the Sonic, the Sonic Frontiers world bosses, and he, he says that they're uh, near Shadow Colossus esque in, in their scale, which I love. And you've probably seen the trail uh, in the trailers. I didn't get a chance to fight. Um, one thing that he shouts out that I, I'm very curious to see how it goes. Right? He he mentions Sonic must hunt down and defeat uh, these in world bosses in order to collect portal gears, which open up portals that lead to bite sized linear stages. Done in the style of previous Sonic games, giving Sonic Frontiers a nice mix of both old and new styles. These classic levels each come with a handful of optional goals, like beating the like beating the level under a certain time, collecting all the red rings, and so on. With each goal rewarding you with a vault key, which are needed to unlock the coveted Chaos Emeralds. I absolutely love like the flow of it where exploring the open world, I did fight some of the in-world bosses and beat them, got the 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 key, right? And I could easily see how that would flow into the, like, okay, cool, let's hop into one of the linear levels he's talking about. Cool, beat that, get the Chaos Emerald and uh, go through that. That sounds like a really great gameplay loop that I would love to, to, to see develop further. Yeah, the one thing for me, uh, somebody who didn't get to pick up the controllers, because like we said, it was kind of a trash fire over there for what, was, what we were told and what, what would actually happen. Uh, Watching it, I walked away with the same impression from the trailer, that first trailer that dropped, where I'm like, I'm interested in this. I want to play this. You know, uh, obviously, I grew up a Sega kid, so I have a soft spot in my heart for Sonic from Sonic 1 and Sonic 2 and Sonic Spinball and so on and so forth. But the 3D Sonics have never been my jam and never been something that's made me go, oh, I should, I want to try that. Watching you guys uh, run around, platform, collect, you know, do the little puzzles, I was like, I can see inherently where the hooks to this are and why I would enjoy this. And if it is, you know, just like you're talking about, Blessed, if you're running, you see something, you stop, you get a little piece of heart and you move on with your life, right? And to the speed question, like, I do think when you're running from 
little point, the little point objective, to figuring out where you want to grind, yada, yada, yada. There is that thing of like, he doesn't look like he's going that fast. But when there was one point, Bless, where you took off and just tore into the open world. Mm-hmm. And that, I was like, damn, that looks fun. Like, you know what I mean? In terms of just running off to what actually, you know, traversing the map and going. So again, if you're going to get faster, if you're going to have more of this stuff, like I'm still cautiously optimistic that I'm going to enjoy this game and want to go play it and want to go unlock whatever their version of shrines are and figure out these puzzles and et cetera and so on. Andy, how does the gameplay differentiate from the any of the older 3D Sonics? Because like I'm still seeing the grinding and the homing, which is like we got we could do better than homing at like I'm just so tired of the homing, y'all. <laughs> like, I mean, it's it's entirely different because it's open world. Like there's just never been a Sonic game that has this much freedom in terms of 3D movement. Like a lot of the homing stuff, you're in a very linear kind of path, even in the adventure games, like yeah. Sonic Adventure 2, right? Like the City Escape. It's like, sure, there's parts of it that you can kind of like choose where you're going, but like the levels are always more Crash Bandicoot than they are Mario 64. Um, and I, I, there's rare exception for that, but that's when the games start falling apart. Uh, I think that this one is kind of like taking it and all the grinding and all the stuff is, and you can see this in like a lot of the trailers that we're, we're getting, those are all kind of like the individual moments where I don't want to call them puzzles, but like you can go do the homing thing up in the sky over there. Or you can go do the puzzle on the floor, or you can do this or that, whatever. It's kind of like, it's just a different style of gameplay that's broken up, I think, a bit better because this one is so much more combat focused than we've had in previous uh, games, especially with the different control schemes. And uh, Andy, I when we were playing it, I was thinking about you, where I was like, I don't think that this game, you're going to like it at all. Like, honestly, like I'm not trying to say that. But I do think that from a combat perspective, like, they are trying to make it where his combos seem more like his combos in smash brothers with his like punch punch kick all that stuff and uh in the combat uh scenarios with the combat uh controls type it does feel more like a platinum game than a sonic game ever has and i feel like when you look at it you're like oh yeah this just looks like 3d sonic always has but it's like no 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 it has those elements but there's so much more balanced out in a way that uh i i think is going to surprise people yeah like he has a counter Right, like he has a parry, like he has a dodge. Yeah, he, ha- he has the things that you'd see in a typical character action game in a way that feels way beyond what he's been doing in, in previous Sonics. And the for like the homing attack stuff, right? Like those do feel like they are, in not instance, but like specific. All right, this is a puzzle solution to get to the next thing. Like it feels that stuff feels way more like platforming than combat. And combat is the thing that is the thing that's been sorely sorely lacking from uh, Sonic games in the past. Um, what was and, your final and, question and, there? Eddie? Yeah, one more thing about the open world stuff. Like, do you? I know a lot of this conversation you all have talked about. Just yeah, there's a lot of choice. You can just kind of do whatever. But are you at any moment given like a little light shove in the right direction of where to go? Well, it's it's not so much like oh, you can do whatever the hell you want. It's more like Mario Odyssey, where it's like there's not really a shove to go in a direction because there's just so many things to do that is the point. You know, it's like, but how, is there anybody talking to you? Yeah, there's, yeah, th- yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. The, the, like, there's, I mean, because it is o- the open zone thing. It's like you are trying to like finish this zone to move on to the next zone. Got Similar it. to Mario Odyssey, where it's like, yo, there's this many moons in this level, but once you get this amount of moons, then you can go to a different level. That kind of feels more the vibe, which is where I think it, it differentiates so much from Breath of the Wild, despite looking like Breath of the Wild. But uh, that's all we got for Sonic Frontiers right now. Right I am now. sure we will have way more to talk about uh, next time we get a chance. Uh, the game is set for 2022, despite fans begging them to delay it. Uh, yeah. they, that's my they, thing is, I want, I want to grab some context now that we can actually talk about it in, in preview form. Because during, during our KFGD this morning, I, I was like, yo, please delay this game. The big reason I do want them to delay, to delay the game is I... I do think that visually and in terms of like how st- how stuff continues to feel, right? Like I still think there is a a janky feel in there that yeah. you can just eliminate that yeah. will bring this game up from what right now, like, I don't know. If I had to put a score, I'd probably put it at like a seven range of how of my hype and, and what I think this is. I think if you delay it another year, give it the time to iron out the bugs, right? Like get that game running smooth, fix like weird animation stuff that goes on and even bugs that I experienced in my build, which again, early build, all that stuff. If this game game comes out and it actually hits right, I think it could get up to like an eight or a nine. And like nine might feel like I'm pushing it, but I don't know, man. As somebody who a nine, as somebody who really likes Sonic and really wants to see Sonic thrive, I think it could get there. And I think this direction is it. Like I think this is how you make a good Sonic game. 
We're going to talk about a whole bunch of other games that we played at Summer Game Fest. But before we do that, let me tell you about our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Athletic Greens. I've been using AG1 the last few months because I figured it was well past time I start thinking about vitamins, but I'm usually not the biggest fan of their format. So being able to drink a flavored water is much more up my alley. And I'm a huge fan here of the fact that it doesn't taste super healthy. It kind of has like this mild tropical taste to it that I look forward to every morning. With one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics and adaptogens to help you start your day right. It's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash kind of funny. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash kind of funny to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance athleticgreens.com slash kind of funny this episode is brought to you by shopify shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved only for big businesses to everyone so upstarts startups established businesses content creators alike can sell everywhere synchronize online and in-person sales and effortlessly stay informed i love how shopify has the tools and resources that make it easy for any business to succeed from down the street to across the globe. Our content creator friends use Shopify to manage all their merch sales and stuff. And I recently got Gia a pair of Allbirds from the Allbirds website, which also uses Shopify. So that's an example of big websites using Shopify for their sales. You can gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting on conversion rates, profit margins, and to help you supercharge your knowledge of your sales and your success. You can go to shopify.com slash KF games, all lowercase for a free 14 day trial, and you can get full access access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash KF games right now. That's shopify.com slash KF games for a free 14 day trial. Shopify.com slash KF games. So Sonic Frontier is definitely one of my favorite games of the show, despite it not being necessarily the best thing ever, but I'm right there with bless. I think there's, there's potential. There's some hope, hopefully, uh, but my game of the show otherwise is no surprise, and it would be Cuphead, The Delicious Last Course. I had such an amazing experience with it. It's coming out super soon, June 30th, which is just two weeks away, uh, coming to all the different systems. And I think some of the the more uh, the, the, the facts of it all is that it is DLC for the original Cuphead. You do need the original Cuphead to be able to play this. Uh, it's a separate island you can go to. They're talking about it being like the most expansive island from the game. Uh, for context, for people that didn't play, the original game has three islands that each have a handful of bosses four or five something like that with a couple um platforming levels with this one they're saying it's just going to be like uh, the biggest island yet uh i got barrett has the footage up right now this was the one boss fight that we were able to play uh there we're playing as miss chalice which is the new character for this game she plays very similarly to cuphead and Mugman, uh but the difference is she has one extra hit point so four instead of three um and she has a double jump and her parry instead of being uh, hitting jump twice like it is for the other two characters is tied to her dash so it actually does change the kind of flow of how you play as her in the uh different fights she definitely was not my favorite i i'm going to be going back to to cuphead or mug man when i play the game for myself fully um and in Sex the demo we played uh, uh in the demo we played <laughs> <laughs> in the demo we played um i couldn't change the controls it was stuck to default which is not how i prefer to to play cuphead and i know a lot of people that were around me were felt the same way um but i tried my hardest to beat this and day one i did not day two i'm very very proud to say i did I did it, ladies and gentlemen. I beat wow. the Cuphead demo. Thank you. Fucking Thank good. you very much. Uh, but it's utterly fantastic. The levels of animation in this are unlike anything we've seen before. The There's a verticality to the boss fight that we're in that I was really impressed with. Um, and it's Cuphead, man. Like Cuphead, I think, is one of the most special games that have ever existed. And this continues to, to prove why. Um, I can't wait to get my hands on it more. Every single person that played this, uh, that enjoyed the first one, was like, yep. It's more Cuphead, and that's really all you can expect for this or want from it, but they absolutely nailed it. Um, do you think uh, the challenge of learning Miss Chalice was uh, what led you to beating it on the second day rather than like being able to download just the boss itself? 
Yeah, totally. Oh. It, it was wrapping my head around the, my controls uh, being an issue. Yeah. And, and, well, that and sounds, also, that, you and all these people complain about the original control scheme sounds like a bunch of Cuphead uh, uh, Joes instead of a bunch of Cuphead pros. You know, don't, you know what I'm saying? Oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. I'll, I'll take it. But I did it. Cup you Joe, know what I mean? Yeah. And I'll so, accept no <laughs> bullshit. And uh, the interesting thing, so um, uh, she's also got like some specific um, – weapons here as well are these specifically tied to her do you know or is this more stuff that you can purchase as cuphead and Mugman in in the store and stuff like that that is an excellent question that i don't have the answer to and what i did find weird is so the demo was just this fight we didn't get right. to walk around the island or anything so i was pretty limited and i don't understand why but every time i would go back to the demo station she had different weapons that i had so huh. there was no way to change it and control it. So I actually got to play with a handful of the different weapons with her. That's cool. Um, but I, I I didn't understand why they were changing. So, yeah, sorry, I don't have the answer to that. I, um, I'll tell you what. I think I'm going to be into her parry style because oh. that's one thing I never loved about Cuphead was that whenever you do parry something, it pushes you higher in elevation where there are more dangers. Uh and I like the idea of just kind of like being parallel. I'm going to hit this thing and stay on the same sort of vertical plane. Because the amount of times that I died trying to parry something and I'd go up to the next level and there's a bad thing up there uh, happened quite often. So I, I think her kit looks pretty neat. Um, any back paddles? Did you have any back paddles there? No, Damn, no, no. Just play it on the, the classic Xbox One controller there. I mean, but uh, Andy, the, here's the other thing, though. Is like You're going to have to start being careful of, because they're playing with verticality here, you're going to have to be careful with her horizontal kind of uh, parry uh, dash thing going on there. Like Just because, you know, you're moving to a different horizontal thing, uh, doing the classic dash with Cuphead, you know, it's not going to be I that feel like different. dashing to a thing feels way more natural to me than double jumping especially because of where my f thumb placement usually is mm -hmm. and i had trouble with that i had to move the jump or i had to move the shoot button to one of the triggers because yeah i was doing the mario world thing uh <laughs> where you hold run with the left button and then you use the fat part of your thumb to jump yeah and sure. double jumping on those motherfuckers was so hard with the fat part of your thumb uh, yeah. to where i, I had to kind of like switch up how i play yeah, and I'm, I'm right there with you, Andy. I totally feel what you're saying about the, the bounce back being kind of weird. I feel like that is just part of the design of the game, and I think that they knew that, and they, it, they clearly did because of what you just explained about her with the more horizontal thing, and Barrett's absolutely right. In this more vertical level, it made it more difficult, but I can see her making some bosses easier and some bosses harder, and I think that's kind of cool. Uh, and with that, her special is that the, the big kind of uh, vertical make a Hadouken thing going on where it takes up the whole screen, which is something mm -hmm. we haven't seen before. And it makes a lot of sense for uh, these type of boss fights that are a little bit more vertical in nature. So uh, I can't wait to play more. I think this is great. I think Barrett, you're going to absolutely love it. This is exactly what we'd want from, from more Cuphead, but Hell we won't yeah. have to wait too long. Hell yeah. I'm, I'm already seeing more than I, uh, I, I want to. I told you like, I, I think a few weeks ago, like I want to go into this, as blind as possible, almost like the the first Cuphead. So, but yeah, I, I can't wait. We're only a, a couple of weeks away. My only uh, question for you, just to go back to the the weapons. Any uh, any new weapons that like kind of stand out to you? Because we've been kind of seeing this this red one and this uh, green one that uh, they've been going back and forth with on on screen here. Yeah, you know, in the original game, I was pretty tried and true with my weapon sets where I would try different things out, but I would always kind of go back to the, the ones that my, oh, I like these the best, I'm going to stick with them. And one of those usually is what we see here, her little, the green boomerang disc things, like uh, right. I, I like as the, a, a good default. But there was a new weapon that she had that shoots out these three lightning bolts, um, and that's what actually I ended up using to to win. So uh, there is some cool stuff. It sends out more of like a, it's like a spread shot in Contra. Um, mm. but it goes like all the way across the screen as opposed to the spread shot in the original cuphead that I think eventually like has a shorter kind of range. Andy, just one, like one last question. How long was the demo again? I mean, the demo was as it was one boss fight. So, okay. uh, as long as it takes you to beat it, I think Whatever. beating it was probably like a minute and a half, maybe two minutes, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I, I had two extended sits with it and i think both of them were about 20 to 30 minutes filled of uh, retries and attempts some of them 
some of them I got hit early in my cool start down retry yeah, yeah. You know, over and over. But I'm uh, already downloading this bear. Are you downloading this? I'm downloading it. No, right I'm now. trying to I'm trying to forget as much as possible right now. I'm just <laughs> look at this boss file. Like I already know my maneuvers, but you know what I'm doing. Um the last thing I want to answer is Alex J. Sandoval in the chat says, Do you get penalized in any way for playing as <laughs> Miss Chalice? Like, does the game mark you as playing on easy mode? Like if you grab the Taduki? Not from what I could tell. And like it. I don't want to say she makes the game easier. I think she just kind of is a different style of play. Like, yeah, her having the extra hit point, I guess, is uh, one of those things. I mean, but, like, but, I, but there are upgrades for both Cuphead and exactly. Mugman that give you a, an extra health point, but then it takes away certain things. So, yeah, it's just a different – it's more of a different play style and giving you another accessibility of, like – maybe a, a way of play that makes sense for a certain group of people that maybe it doesn't for others. Right. Yeah. I, it's all about options. And I think that this is, is opening up a lot of options, which is fantastic. Uh, the next game I want to talk about is one of Greg's favorite games of the show. Wrestle quest. Wrestle quest is my game of the show. It's the one uh, I left and I was ho- sitting there in the airport. And I'm like, God damn, do I wish I had that right now on switch ready to go. Uh, Wrestle quest, of course, uh, might not be completely unfamiliar to many of you because I know a lot of you went to PAX East and you saw that there and had tweeted at me about it. Obviously when Wrestle quest got announced, a lot of you tweeted about it. Uh, the idea here is that you are getting a turn-based RPG wrestling game. Uh, you play as the muchacho man, Randy Santos. That's who I saw in this demo. There is another character you will play as, but we didn't get introduced to them until the very, very, very end and didn't do anything with them. And the idea is that you are toys. You are wrestling toys in the world. And so it sounds goofy. It's, it is goofy. It sounds like uh, this would all be unlicensed stuff. It isn't. They actually work with a bunch of different wrestlers in their estates. So Macho Man Randy Savage is in this game in terms of his name. There he is. Diamond Dallas Page is in this game. Jeff Jarrett is in this game. Andre the Giant is in this game. Jake the Snake is in this game. Uh, mean Gene Okerlund is in this game as the announcer. And so the idea is uh, you are in a toy world. You are an action figure. That's what everybody else looks like, too. They're all toys as well. And, you know, uh, Randy Santos has loved wrestling his entire life. Uh, he sleeps in the gym and dreams of being a real uh, wrestler. And we start with him even being a backyard wrestler. And you go off and do it. And it's turn-based combat in a wrestling ring, as you see here. There, You wrestle outside of the ring, obviously, and fight a lot, too. And what I found is that it's actually active combat, which I appreciate. So, you know, even if you do a simple move, you saw a second ago, uh, a B button popped up there's you know you somebody pounds off the ropes when you punch them you have another shot to hit them there uh the bar you saw there was for the pins uh, as it goes back and forth you have to nail it and get it in there and then your special moves or you know what would be magic in a lot of rpgs is called gimmick and these are the bigger moves you can do stuff with so this is where i was doing a stunner and i was that's also where you'd go to pin uh it's clever it's funny and it's a nice take on wrestling right i always want more wrestling games and i'd love for them to get out of just being you know the traditional thing is what we want of okay well is it a sim wrestling game or an arcade wrestling game uh taking this and putting a lot of humor and infusing it into a wrestling world i think works really well and you know you are exploring uh, different environments on that you have an overworld map you go to these different things for quests when you're there, there are treasure chests to find. You will find doors blocked by tables, and the only way to get through them is to use a table token, which will then do a move that would throw a wrestler through a table and stuff like that to then advance. Uh, I found the entire thing incredibly clever. Uh, I think it's got a really great art style. I think it's got a really cool world for it. Great so, art style. I want to play yeah. a lot more of it. It's just not there yet. Uh, they I, When I asked when is it coming out, I, the developers were there, Mega Cat Studios, it's Skybound published game. You know, I asked when is it coming out, and they might have actually just been Telltale, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, Skybound uh, publishing people. They were like, well, we're targeting 2022, which means you will not see it this year at all. But it was awesome, and I really enjoyed it. Sorry, Tim, you want uh- no, just real quick, uh, talk about the visuals. Yeah, the yeah. game looks fantastic. And I unfortunately didn't get uh, to play this one, but I watched you and Bless play a little bit. And I was taken aback by how stunning this looked. Like, obviously, it's an old school pixelated uh, type game, but the resolution of it looked so good. And just kind of the the shadows and the, the effects that they did. The style is so great that on a giant 4K TV, like I knew this would look good on a Switch. Seeing yeah. it on a giant TV, I was like, yo, this looks really damn good. Yeah, and and to be clear too, I think I said Switch earlier, but to make sure it's it's Switch, it's PC, it's Xbox, it's PlayStation. They're all listed over there, obviously for you know backwards or whatever you know uh, smart delivery, and then you know PS5, PS4. Uh, yeah, I thought it looked good. I thought it played really well. I thought it was interesting. Blessing, you played a bit. What did you think? 
I, I thought it was cool. You know, I had uh, pretty much the same takeaway as you. I thought it, I thought it was really dope. The uh, I love the um, I, what, what they're called gimmicks. The yeah. moves, they yeah, can the special choose. moves yeah. are called gimmicks. Yeah, the, you can choose from the special moves to uh, bust out actual WWE moves or like not WWE, but like professional wrestling moves that you know I thought was super awesome. I thought I thought it was super fun. And yeah, rock, walking around the overworld, uh, the vibrancy of it reminds me a bit of Nobody Saves the World, and I really liked how that game looked when you're walking through through the overworld and sure. so. Yeah, it's one that I'm I'm very much looking forward to. And you saw at the be uh, the bottom of some of the stuff earlier. There is a hype meter, not this. This is the pin mini game or the kick out submission mini game. Uh, right there, you see a hype meter uh, that determines how much money you'll get uh, in these early early tutorial battles. You weren't really getting to explore that and see what that's all about, but there could be something there. And like I said, you know, like it's playing with a bunch of different ideas. So the idea is that, you know, Randy is very much believes professional wrestling is real. Uh, the other person that we'll get later is very much in it as a business kind of thing. So you play two different sides of it. But, you know, like Randy's living at the gym and the guy who's helping him train, you know, asks him to go help another guy from, I want to say the BWF, but or whatever. It was something like B or maybe it's BECW or something like that. It, they have a bunch of different monikers. And you go to that guy who needs face paint. So you help him by going to the face paint shop. But of course there's bad guys there. You beat them, you get the face paint, you come and the guy's like, well, should I be a cool surfer dude? Or should I be super intimidating? Obviously illusions to sting right off the bat. And you get to make that choice, which will then influence the character and what happens in the world. And I'm sure it's, that is all superficial, but again, it's not just, you know, wrestling to climb the ladder of whatever federation you're in. It is wrestling uh, as a way to pr move these little storylines that are tangentially connected to wrestling forward. Can't wait. It looks so damn awesome. Yeah. Uh, another one that I unfortunately didn't get to play was Escape Academy. And I think uh -huh. that this is one of the, the smaller indie titles. Uh, this is from I Am 8-Bit. And I would say that just from talking to everyone at the show that had played things, this was definitely a standout where uh, everyone that played it was like, hey, keep your eye on this. It's a lot cooler sure. than you'd expect. You guys got to play it together. Bless, what did you think about it? Yeah, I thought it was super cool. If Street Fighter 6 wasn't there, I think this might be my game of the show. Um, it is a, a first-person co-op uh, escape room puzzle game where the, the the media comparison I draw for it is Operation Tango. Uh, if folks remember that one that came out uh, sure. last June around this time for PS Plus, where it is you're working together with a co-op partner. You're going through these puzzle rooms. In Operation Tango, you are a spy and an agent. In this game, you're a student who uh, is attending. Is it literally called Escape Academy, Greg? Do you yeah, yeah. So you're going to an escape room academy to train you to be the best escape pe artist you can be. Yeah. So like in, in the demo that me and Greg did, me and Greg did, did a co-op. We went through one escape room, I'll say like challenge, right? Like one es escape room level that was four parts. Uh, and for the one we did, it started off on like a first floor where the water starts filling the room. And me and Greg had a seemingly a, a limited amount of time to figure out what we needed to do. So it was us figuring out, all right, like all right, look look around, you know, interact with the things around us. All right, it looks like we might need a key. Okay, well, how do we get the key? Okay, use the code. All right, what's the code? Like, and it's it's a lot of going back and forth based on what each other is seeing and what mm -hmm. each other can kind of uh, feed to each other in terms of the information that's help that that'll help solve the puzzle. And for the one level that me and Greg did, I had a blast with it. Like uh, all all the 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 the, the calls that we made in terms of uh, it being like, oh, I need a letter. Oh, I need a number. Okay, no, I see this number here. Try typing this five. Uh, digit code here to see if the thing opens there was a lot of a lot of that kind of experimentation that uh led to really good back and forth cooperation i mean you nailed it you yeah got an a. yeah we, we got an a yeah only one other team at the time had gotten an a plus blessing blamed himself because he accidentally used a hint at one point so i think that's what yeah. might have brought us down yeah, but yeah. it doesn't matter that is, my biggest critique is that the hint button is i think x uh, like square if you're using a playstation controller way too easy to hit that button i hit it on accident and so that was you know for me I was really impressed with this as well. And I was definitely on the, not that I wasn't looking forward to it, but like, okay, like I, it reminded me a little bit of keep talking, nobody, or I, coming in, keep talking and nobody explodes, which is fun, but frustrating sometimes where it's just like, okay, like do what I really want to do a lot of this. And after me and Bless played it and yeah, went through this story mission, I would. And I think what's interesting about it, you know, Bless, you called out that, you know, seemingly it, like you have a limited amount of time. We did it. There was no fail state for us drowning. It was very much like, at the end, you get graded, and it's based on your time and how many hints you did. And I, like, they break it down for like not only how each floor, if you want to think of it as a big puzzle, they break it down to the minutia of how long it took you to figure out like fuses or mm -hmm. how long it took you to figure out the combination or whatever. Like, there's a lot of little nerdy details to really go in there. And that was what was interesting about it for me is that how do you do uh, something as weird as you are a student in an escape academy, right? How do you make that make sense? And this was a narrative thing where the, we were with the custodian. It started to flood. He had to run off and then we had to figure our way out. And again, coming into it, it's like, all right, cool. Like 
This is a video game version of an escape room. And if you watched, of course, like you said, this is, you know, being published by 8-Bit. It was part of Day of the Devs. Coin Crew Games is who's making it. Uh, if you came in and watched Day of the Devs, like they did a whole thing of like, oh, we actually made escape rooms before. So we're trying to bring that experience to a video game. And we've done those, obviously. In per- I've done an escape room in person. I know we've done them on the Kind of Funny podcast before. Coming into this, it's like, well, how are you going to make that feel, a video game, feel like a real escape room? And this definitely felt like a real escape room. Because again, it was me and Blessing going to opposite sides of each floor. Okay, there's a combination lock on this. I see this. I have half a number here. Well, I've picked this thing up. And then I have box cutters. We need a key. And you start, you know, tracking it all together to get where it is to the, you know, the, eventually where Blessing's, got his he's found the cipher he's got it pulled up on his screen i'm looking at the words on the wall and i'm using a notepad then to translate or you know actually figure out what the code break what it's going to be and what we need to go from there like it had that level of teamwork it had that level of pressure but i really appreciated that it wasn't like you're gonna drown in five seconds you know blah, blah, blah. it was working against your own time working against your friends i thought that worked andy timothy gettys fret not my 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 young friend my young friend timothy gettys fret not Academy or Escape Academy and Russell Quest are both a part of Steam Next Fest, and the demos oh. are up and downloadable. Oh, so you should cool. all go get those, yeah, because they it, it was a lot of fun to get in there and figure it out. And you know, at one point we solved one of the new number. We we had like all the pieces in place, and then it was like a combination lock. And then before we actually set the number on the thing, I was able to stumble into it. And we're like, got it, nailed it. And then like the next puzzle wanted us to know some part of that information. We're like, fuck, yeah. but it was like. A fun way of trying to figure that out and get back to it. Very How much cool. um, interaction was there with like NPCs and stuff like that? In our demo, none. Like it was set up by the guy. Like, okay. you know what I mean? Like the custodian called and was like, oh no, I'm sorry. I'll get back to you guys in a second. Blah, blah, blah. And then you were off to your own. In the actual game, I don't know how much there'll be. I think they showed some in the Day of the Devs trailer where you have like, uh, you know, uh, persona like talking. Yeah, you're talking to like the headmaster and like, yeah, yeah the text yeah. pops up like that. The Dumbledore. Yeah. We didn't, you know? uh, we only got to experience the level, but right, right after we beat the level, they did kick us back to a dorm room. And I was actually surprised that uh, it seems like there's a lot more there you can do in terms of just like uh, different modes you can get into. And when I say mm-hmm. modes, I'm like, you know, maybe ex- exploring like the campus or like, you know, being able to find how you talk to different people. It seems like there's way more depth in there than just the base. All right, jump to a level, solve the thing, bust out. Like, no, there's an actual dorm and seemingly story element in there that seems gonna be, like it's going to be cool as well. I can't wait to. This is one I, I legit can't wait to play uh, with with friends. Like either it's gonna be Yami because I did um, Operation Tango with Yami, or I, Janet. Uh, me and Janet when we hosted the Skybound Game Showcase. This is one of the ones that stood out to us as well. And like I could see me and Janet going crazy with this one. And my notes say, of course, it's coming to everything but Switch. Game Pass is included, and I have July fourteenth jotted down. So I do believe you don't have to wait long. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, next up, Greg, Star Trek Resurgence kind of got you going. Tell me all about it. Yeah, you know, I put up a TikTok about this, and it was harkening back to when I was super into Star Trek Discovery during season one. I went out to host a panel out there, or a, a red carpet for them for season two. And so I was marathoning all of Discovery, and it was my first real time outside of the movies getting into Star Trek. And what I loved about it was obviously the decisions happen, the relationships that happen in there. And so I wanted a video game that was Star Trek. And I, you know, I downloaded Star Trek online and did a bunch of things. None of it was really working for me. And I kind of gave up on the dream, but now Star Trek uh, resurgence is coming out from dramatic labs. I wouldn't expect you to know that name off the top of your head, but what you need to know is that it's a development team of like 30 to 40 people. Obviously they are, you know, moving people around as they get closer to the game releasing. And half of them are people who worked at telltale. So these are the people who know narrative games and story-based games. And so I got to play this. Uh, if you're a big fan like Nick, and I know Nick's played it as well, actually, at demos before. Uh, this is set after Star Trek Nemesis, which is the last of the next generation movies. And it's five years before the Romulus supernova that would then be, you know, reset time and make the J.J. Abrams universe. And you, this is another game we're going to be playing two different perspectives. You're playing a guy named uh, Carter Diaz, who's like an engineer. He's lower on the totem pole. And then First Officer Rydek is the other person you'll play, who was uh, the woman there with the, I don't know which alien species it is, but she has like the spine on the front of her uh, head there, on her forehead. And, you know, what I played from and what I've seen from the get-go, even as you look at this trailer, right, this game is not going to win awards for visuals. I don't think it looks bad, but it definitely does not look like, oh my God, what a... PlayStation 5, next gen, push it all. Andy's moving his uh, field of view around to go play this thing. You know what I mean? Like, it looks like a small indie Star Trek game, which I'm not against. Uh, but I, what I, what 
got me. And then Alex J. Sandoval says, Klingon? No, not a Klingon. It was, she's that woman right there. She's not a Klingon. I know what a Klingon looks like in this universe. Uh, anyways, that's Diaz, and that's not her. That's one with her back to you, is uh, the other woman. Uh, that her right there. Um, what is she? Uh, Alex J. Sandoval, you smart ass. Anyways. Uh, well, you're I, going I just lost the thread of what was happening. <laughs> 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 We're debating what kind of alien it is. Uh, anyways, though, back to what I'm saying. Visuals won't win any awards, but what was there for me was the choices and the story. Right, I, we played three distinct scenes. One was uh, Carter Diaz and her, his friend, who you saw there in the bay, having to interact with the captain. And you, you know, are you smart ass? Are you not a smart ass? Are you talking to this? Are you doing that? Uh, and it, you know, then the next one was uh, Rydek going to uh, with actually uh, Ambassador Spock going to a you know they've been called in to help negotiate a peace between two warring races this is one of them if you're watching the video and so like how do you play that what choices do you make you know at the very end it is like well it's from the one of the really fired up i think the queen of the one uh, race like what would you do you something similar happen to your people would you you know like you make a choice there and that can obviously get you in trouble with ambassador spock or do this or whatever and really negotiate out of that and then the final one we did was another Talkie, talkie, talkie. We're t- I'm back to being Cap- uh, Carter Diaz. I'm flying through. I'm talking to some other guy, and we're flying in a space shuttle to, you know, to drop these probes. With then, obviously, there's more to this than we thought there was. There's a bad guy over there. But the conversation was interesting enough. But flying the ship wasn't fun, which I thought was interesting because these are always the push and pull of these kind of games that I do love. Like, can you make the story great and the gameplay fun? This very specifically flying the ship, I was like. All right, well, like it's, you know, I'm flying through this asteroid field. I'm not shooting any, even the asteroids or whatever. And it's just, you know, steer, strafe, accelerate, deaccelerate. Like it wasn't much, but I enjoyed the conversation I was having. So I'm excited for this game. This is on my short list of things coming out of uh, Summer Game Fest where I'm like, fuck yeah, I, I, I want to play a lot of this. Uh, bless Soul Hackers 2 was another one that the two of you guys played. Yeah, uh, this is one that it's a Michael Hyam special. I, like a few months ago, they, uh, Atlas announced this one uh, during like some stream that was going on in the middle of the night uh, during the during the day in Japan. And 3 a.m., I hear yells from Michael Hyam's room, and I'm like, "What the fuck is going on?" Like, I hope he's good. And I check Twitter real quick because I'm like, oh, "These seem like hype yells. They don't. These don't seem like oh, yells." <laughs> and I look, and it's like a Soul Hackers two thing. I'm like, "Oh." All right, cool. What is this? I don't know what this is. Uh, but seemingly, it, it is another game in that um, uh, that tree of Shin Megami Tensei, like Persona, like those types of franchises, right? Like it exists in that family. And the thing that got me, and Greg can speak more to it, because Greg got, I think, a bit more hands-on with the actual world segments of it. I played a bit of the, the dungeon gameplay. It seems like it's kind of an in-between between Persona and Shin Megami Tensei, where it takes place in a, uh, is that a future Tokyo, Greg, do you recall? Uh, I don't remember them telling me where it was. It's a future city. It's definitely futuristic, yeah, neon, splash, city, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it has, like, you know, you look at the gameplay here, uh, Bright Now Bear has pulled up combat. This is the thing that immediately got me in. You know, one thing that I I wish I I was able to push past uh, in Shin Megami Tensei, but I think that game was was a little bit more hardcore about was the dungeon crawling and and, and the combat. Like that is very tra- traditional. That game was very traditional. Shin Megami Tensei talking about SMT five. Whereas this is taking a lot of the elements that Persona five introduced in terms of the one button, like you know hit a hit um you know X for attack, pull up menu, like the UI is leaning towards some of the persona bits in terms of how quick you can kind of manage around the combat plus like you know press the assist button pull up an automatic attack be able to go from there and keep the flow going of it it has that stuff it has uh, really interesting dungeon mechanics in terms of you being able to take a, a a member of your party being one of the demons you know that you typically see jack frost and the like be able to call on pixies. onto uh they're called pixies no, I mean, yeah, Jack Frost was there. Pixie was there. I'm saying oh, yeah, the yes, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. if you played any Persona like I have, you would be like, oh, I, I recognize this. Yeah, like you recognize the different assortment of, of demons and monsters, right? Like you can take them, the ones that are in your party, send them out to do, um, uh, what's the word, Greg, where you like somebody searches through a dungeon before you go into it? Oh, scout. Yeah, like like recon missing. Recon, yeah, they're basically reconning the the the. My the demo dungeon. didn't tell me about this. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, I think this is when they pra- pass the controller to me. But yeah, you, can, you you'll send out your monsters to recon uh, the dungeon, and like as you're exploring the dungeon, you run into them, and they give you items, right? So it's not kind of like a fun, different way to do That's this cool. kind of a uh, uh, dungeon crawling. But Greg, you got to experience more of the overworld stuff. Like, what yeah. was your take on that? For me, I thought it was awesome. Like, I thought I, I really dig the style of the game, right? And I think we come to expect that from an Atlas, you know, turn based RPG like this. But, you know, one of the things they were talking about me was like, you know, how soul levels are so important. Obviously, they're similar to, you know, your relationship links in a Persona game, but going out and drinking with them. And like, so they took one of them, one of my, you know, characters, or one of my 
comrades to a bar to drink with them and like had a conversation that was so over my head because we're deep into the game and i don't understand what they're talking about it because she's just, you know some eternal god or some shit i don't know what that was going on that was cool you know we went to the weapon shop i thought it was it was cool that they used this what we- your weapon is called a comp and so everybody has a comp right and it's that's what your weapon is it's not like you can switch around your weapons or do anything so like you know the one woman had size the other guy had a tommy gun i thought that was rad i thought that was yeah here you go drinking just like this at the bar to you know have those conversations and move it forward and move the story forward and who you all are but then there's the hook to them that you know they were telling us this is a detective story you know this is what they is a hard-boiled detective magical story for what's going on in this world you know to be a soul hacker and to go in there and do that and so I think the combat is going to be very familiar if you've played a Shimagon Tensei or a Persona before, right? Like that turn-based stuff. It has the assist feature that I, I was excited about. And plus, like, well, I was in Persona 5. I was like, I don't even remember that anymore. But auto-picking, you know, right to the weakness if you've already discovered that anim- that animal, that enemy's weakness, and getting to go out there and fight him. Uh, you know, they were one of the things they were talking about of trying to make it different and also not easier, but a bit more, hey, you want to go grind and have fun, you know, to recruit a demon, right? It's just to give them an item. It's not like how it is in Persona 5, right, where you're having that conversation with them and trying to outthink them and having to listen and go back and forth, and then you screwed up on the third try like I did all the time, and they run away. This is just like, oh, cool, can I get X? Yeah, sure, here it is. You go for that, you go. Uh, They were predicting, you know, playthroughs are like 50 to 60 hours, which is obviously down from certain of them, which is uh, better if you're mean, can never have the attention span anymore. And then, you know, they were talking about uh, one of the things, another person who was getting the demo with us was asking that I thought was interesting is there's no fast forward for battle. But if you're using auto, obviously you can speed through your other people's turns to get to you faster. But I thought that was interesting. Yeah, one of the things they mentioned to going back to, to combat a little bit, um, uh, like Greg said, right? You have the assist feature; it'll automatic, automatically target weakness on an enemy, and you press X and it goes. Um, when you hit a weakness, it's not like Persona Five where you get the extra turn. I forget if Shin Megami Tensei Five has that as well. But when you hit the weakness, you build up a certain meter. Um, it goes up. It goes up by numbers, right? So it starts off as one. If you hit a, a weakness of an enemy, uh, certain times the that meter will will tick up to two or three. That meter then determines at the end of the turn you get an all-out attack automatically, and your all. all all out attack, Barry knows what I'm talking about, Persona fans know what I'm talking about, right? Extra attack that you get in a turn. Uh, the power of it is determined by the amount of weak spots that you hit, as opposed to like the flow of all right, cool. Let me yeah, yeah, yeah it, 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 typically in like in a like a Persona 5 or any of the Persona games, right? Uh, you just have to hit the weaknesses of all of the enemies in a, a, a combat scenario to kind of like yeah. down them and stun them. And when they're all stunned, then you would get an all out attack. But it seems here it's more of like a, a meter, uh, type yeah. Of this game. is a, they have a stack meter, yeah. yeah. yeah stack, that's exactly what it is, yeah. The stack meter that that, that builds that, that up, and so it's a different it's a different flow of combat, but I actually really like it one because it makes things a bit fresh from a persona, uh, but then also. So one of my frustrations playing Persona 5 before I even got uh, Royal was if you have a bad turn or if you have bad luck and you somehow get ambushed or something goes wrong, your enemies, in the ways that you can just fucking slap your enemies <laughs> by using the all the, um, the the abusing the weaknesses and all that stuff, they can do the same thing to, to you. And so you might get into a flow where the enemy goes first and automatically you're just fucked because they get into a good flow, hit all your weaknesses, and all of a sudden you're done. Um, that isn't going to be the case in this game seemingly it seems like um uh if you have that frustration if you're like me you'll have maybe a more fun in the time in this game not having to worry about that um but yeah it's one that seems to split the difference between persona and shimagama tensei in a way that you know I, I messaged barrett immediately i was like yo you might like soul hackers you know the world seems cool seems the the stuff going on in the overworld uh seems like it's more adult focused as opposed to being the teenage high school story of persona um which appeals to me i'm down to go out drinking with these people and figure out what this detective story is fall and the dungeon, fall in love maybe the mm-hmm. dungeon crawling seems like it's going to have that similar loop there as well that um that i'm looking forward to yeah, the, when you talk about the gameplay aspects, all, all, all of it, like, it definitely uh, checks the boxes of, like, what I'd be into. I think it's, I don't know what it is. I, don't, I It might be the very anime futuristic style that kind of loses me a little bit. Mm. I don't know if that's mm. just something that, like, maybe. I dug like, it. Uh, like, that was the thing is we ran around yeah. and explored the world. That was something I was like, oh, man, it's actually kind of pulling me in. Yeah, maybe maybe I have to actually get my hands on it and like uh, actually see the world for myself. But like seeing it in kind of like trailers and images and stuff, it's not a vibe that really speaks to me, which is weird because I like sci-fi stuff, I like futuristic stuff, but I don't know what it is here specifically that like isn't really pulling me. But Actually, everything right. else I mean, sounds I... cool, and like I definitely want to uh, try it out because it's coming this year, right? It's coming pretty soon. Yeah, it's yeah August year. It's a couple months away. Yeah, graphically and stylistically too. And I think it 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 doesn't have as much like cool pop 
as a Persona mm-hmm. game, right? Which is fair because it's different, right? Shin Megami Tensei yeah. had the same thing where I was like, oh, this isn't this isn't as poppy, right? This is more hardcore and dark. Um, but this does have some cool stylish, stylistic stuff. Again, you have the cyberpunk setting and the, the UI invokes cyberpunk in a way that, you know, the detail of it reminds you a bit of Persona 4, more so than a, the, than a 5 mm-hmm. in terms of the amount mm-hmm. of uh, st- the, the, the style of UI they're going for there. Sorry, Barry, you're about to say something. Um, yeah, I was just uh, asking of the demo. Did you guys uh, play? Was that um, localized? I, I forget if like I remember they re- uh, revealed a little bit of the localization like last week uh, for like ten seconds. Is that coming out uh, at the same time, or is that doing like the weird Persona thing where it's like, uh, you know, they we have the Japanese version for a, a few months and then uh, the English version comes like four or five months later. It's a great question. We saw like 900 games. It didn't stand out to me that we were. It was in Japanese, so I would assume it was localized when I listened, but I couldn't tell you at this point. Yeah, I do not recall hearing the voice acting, um, but I would be surprised if it's not local lo- because it's coming out day and day. I believe in uh, the the West and in Japan, and so I'd imagine gotcha. that it has to be. Do you think they'd put me in the game as a voice? If you asked, yeah, sure. If you asked nicely, <laughs> you asked. <laughs> uh, so those were all the the big main games that we played. We also played a whole bunch of other stuff that I want to touch on uh, all of it just just a little bit. So now we're entering lightning round we'll of all of this it. stuff. Yeah. Just uh, impressions. Oh quick uh, of what we played because uh we're about to get into a lot of the day of the dev stuff that i do want to give some time because i i really do think that day of the dev showed up at this event and had a ton of really really cool games to play oh, yeah. this isn't one of them but i want to talk about the samsung gaming hub um which was the xbox uh the app, game pass app, all that app, stuff app, the, app, the, yeah. the cloud being available on new samsung tv starting june 30th 2022 and going forward all of them will have it and uh you get to access the uh, ac- everything you can on xbox cloud with your TV and a controller. And let me just tell you, it just works. I was very impressed with this. It was 1080p 60. Um, any game that you can play on xCloud, you could play here. Uh, in the demo we did, we could only play first party titles, but we were playing on Wi Fi. The Wi Fi at the event was utter trash, and this thing worked and it worked well. And I was extremely surprised by that. Um, being able to pop into Halo Infinite, walk around for a little bit, pop out, pop into Ori. It all happened seamlessly. There's this little like loading screen that comes and goes within 20 seconds or less, and you are just playing the game. I was very, very impressed with that. Any follow up thoughts on that, boys? No, you nail it. it. I went over there. I played Minecraft. I, I, you know, I jumped in at Minecraft. I jumped into something else. I jumped out, jumped out. Like it all is doing what it should be doing, and it is feeling like, you know, there isn't latency there. Again, like, I wanted to do Fortnite. They wouldn't let you do Fortnite. It was, you know, the select stuff they had available there, but it was neat, and it's, you know, definitely something that'll be cool if that's, you know, not not even if it's not your only option. If you buy a new TV and you have it, I think that's a great option to not lug your Xbox over if you just want to do something. Did they answer any questions, uh, or or did they have any information about non-Samsung type stuff, or like a little box or anything like that? This was no, Samsung it's a, it's a, demoing it technically. So they were pushing the TVs. And like that's the thing is it's not just Xbox. Like the, you, there's other things yeah. that they weren't really talking about it because it was a, a partnership with Xbox there. But like pretty interesting. I it really did feel like a, a step towards progress to getting a streaming uh situation for any TV. And if it works this well, I'm very impressed with it. Cause like Greg was saying, I think that this uh is going to really fill two voids of needs, one of them being I have my Xbox downstairs. Like, I don't want to have to lug it upstairs, but boom, yeah. you can just pop into a game real quick. And God, how seamless it was with your account and the saves and everything. Very impressive. And, and, on and, the and you mentioned side, it was on Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi? Yeah, we were playing on Wi-Fi. I think, wow. I think this was hardwired. Oh, was it? Yeah, I asked them about it. Okay, well, if yeah, that's yeah. the case, then well, it worked hardwired, which I guess shouldn't cool. be too big of a surprise. But because uh, I, I was shocked at how good it was working off uh, if it was Wi-Fi. So, yeah, there you go. Yeah, um, even, even still, right? Like, even with that, I was very impressed by it. I played a bit of Halo. And I, the only thing, I, the only even, like, critique I have with it that I'm sure long-term will be figured out is there was um the, like, like the small squares. There's, like, a word for it. Artifacting. artifacting. There was, like, artif- artifacting going on um, on the screen every now and then for Halo. But I was shocked by how smooth it felt. Like yeah, the totally. actual first person shooting felt snappy. I forgot at times that I was playing off of a, a Samsung smart TV and it had me excited for it, uh, for, for the idea that I could do it on my own. Only thing is that they mentioned that right now, imminently the release they're piping up is for 2022 Samsung TVs and further. And mine is like a 2021. Not and a I'm, new TV. That's a two year old TV. It's time to buy a new one. I mean, one, it might, it might be time to buy a new one, but for the similar thing that Tim was saying, right? Like 
I love the idea that I can just keep my Xbox Series X on my monitor or on a specific screen and then be able to walk towards the TV or walk toward the TV in my living room and start and pick up and play Xbox games that way and not have to worry about transporting transporting a thing back and forth. I have my fingers crossed that they start to support more Samsung TVs, but I'm also like, they you won't. know, they're, <laughs> they're trying to sell those 2022 TVs. <laughs> Yeah, but I might buy uh, one. We'll see. But very impressive stuff, and I think that like we're we're just getting to a point where the foundations are are in our past, and we're moving towards a future where this thing's it just works even better than it already just works. Um, next up, Metal Hell Singer, Andy. I kind of want your thoughts on this one because you've been playing it back at home. Yeah, I've been playing a lot of Metal Hell Singer. Got pretty addicted to the demo of it. Been posting a lot on social about it because they have leaderboards for the demo, which is really sick. But it's essentially. Doom, if it were a rhythm game, it's all set to music from um, that's specifically made for the game. So it's not licensed or anything like that. You don't have to worry about DMCA taking you down. But they have a lot of different artists from the uh, metal world, a bunch of different uh, vocalists and guitarists and stuff from like uh, Lamb of God. And they have Surge Tank and from System of a Down. And they just have a lot of people from the music industry adding uh, their talents to this. But it is... Uh, incredibly satisfying like i i just was mesmerized the whole time i was playing it because of how good it feels to play and everybody tells me to check out bpm now um which is something i definitely should check out but this felt so great and the music just kicks so much ass and the higher multiplier you have more of the song is revealed so once you get to 60 multiplier the vocals are there and if you fuck up, you will lose your multiplier uh, and then the vocals will be gone. You'll kind of feel like, all right, I need to get that momentum back in. But it plays so smoothly. It is fast as hell. It's super fun. The abilities are a blast. It is like immediately shot up to one of my most anticipated for the rest of the year. I believe it's out in September. So I, I can't wait to get the full release of this. I can already tell that this is going to be one of my like top 10 of the year. It's funny, yeah. you mentioned, it's funny you mentioned BPM because uh, I pl I played a little bit of BPM Bullets per Minute when that first dropped, and it kind of ruined my appetite for Metal Hell Hellsinger because I remember after afterwards seeing Metal Hellsinger and go, uh, I didn't really like BPM. Am I gonna like this Metal Hellsinger game? And I getting to play it at the show floor, I'm right I'm right there with you. Like like I can't believe how how good this game feels to play. Like it it is a Doom inspired game that somehow hits a, a similar level of intensity and you know real uh, smooth gunplay and, and great enemy placement and all that stuff but then also every shot you hit has to be on rhythm and they somehow nail that in a way that playing bpm i didn't really feel like they nailed it i, I felt like i was held back by this stuff in this game i'm like oh fuck yeah let me hit that reload wait for the the yellow dot to come through hit it perfectly and now i'm now i'm feeling real great about it um and i'm right there with you like now this game is up there as far as oh man i gotta play this when, when this comes out yeah, and it uh, it it not even, not only just kind of hitting on beat, but you can also active reload on beat as well. And if you get an enemy weak, you sort of get they light up like they do in Doom Eternal, where you go do the glory kill or whatever. But in here, it's just really dope to hit it on beat as well, especially when you're kind of just almost crafting like a musical experience where it's like I could hit this finisher here. But I'm going to wait for the next bar to hit because it's going to feel so fucking Hell sick yeah. to hit it there. And like, yeah, I think uh, like this song will forever be burned into my head because of how much I've played it. Um, I, I played it on stream last night for like three hours in addition to the two hours I was playing it before then. Just I'm rank Everybody, I'm rank 132 in the world. Hell oh yeah. God, Andy. Yeah, I'm it's up totally there. Wow. Um, but it is just so much freaking fun, dude. And I can't believe like. I, it initially was one of these videos that I saw skill up post and that's why I mentioned it during the presentation. I guess it was summer games. Fest. So I was like, how many copies did skill up sell for this game? Because I'm the, he's the one who I first heard of it from. And then uh, obviously we saw that presentation at summer game fest. The demo is available, I believe on PS five series S and X and PC. Um, and I could not recommend it more. Go give it a shot. Even if you're not, into metal as a music genre which like i don't really listen to a whole lot of metal either um but it kind of just harkens back to uh my my teen years listening to metal with friends and stuff like that it's a fucking blast and it is just like as hardcore uh, you know as you would want from a, a game in this genre and then the boss fight brings in a different song at a faster tempo 
and they've got sort of returnal bullet hell type mechanics where they're shooting waves of shots at you and you have to jump over those attacks yeah. and you have to like duck here and dash to the left and you can dash on beat as well and it's so much goddamn fun i could not recommend it anymore uh continuing lightning round Angerfoot, andy <laughs> Angerfoot, fucking hysterical so much fun it's basically hotline miami if it were a first person shooter you're kicking down doors, you're kicking bad guys, but you can also pick up weapons from bad guys that they might have while they're shooting at you. It's basically, you know, you get you can get killed a couple of times or shot a couple of times. It's not like it's a one time you're out and you have to restart the run, but um, your health will regenerate if you just want to hide behind a wall. It is absolutely f like just hysterical. It's so funny. It's so just twisted and weird in that sort of devolver humor type way. Um, it's very unhinged. You were essentially this weird looking dude and you have a, uh, everything you do is with your feet. There's a sequence where you feed your girlfriend, uh, popcorn with your foot and then you get a fax machine. You get a fax in, they tell you, Hey, check your fax machine and you check it out and it's a photo and they kidnapped one of your shoes oh and God. there's like one of your shoes is tied up and there's a gun to it oh and so God. you have to go save your shoe from these like gangsters it's or whatever genius. it's so much fun it's funny as hell and it it just understands what it wants to be and it's going to seem like one of those that and also the demo is super meaty like, it was a long ass demo that lasts quite a while so go Wait, check many, that out how many it's levels are in the demo because i i tried it myself i got to level two and i i finished level two and it won't let me go past that is, is there more than that yeah, like there, you get level eleven is where the boss fight is. Oh shit! It just keeps on. Oh, going I gotta go going. back. I don't know what I did wrong then, because yeah, I picked it up. I finished level two, and I was like, "Oh, that's weird that it ends here." It must be that there's only ten levels in the game. I guess the game's gonna be real short. That makes way more sense. That like for some reason it just didn't let me uh, keep going. But yeah, no, I'm dude. The, I played this game on the plane uh, on my Steam Deck on the way down to LA. It didn't run well on the Steam Deck, but regardless, I was like, I'm gonna push through this because I'm having a, bla a blast playing it. Like it. It does feel exactly like Hotline Miami. Music in kicks. Person. Music kicks in and it's fire. Like the, I mean, kicking the kicking doors into enemies and then kicking like other enemies into other enemies. It is ridiculous in some of the best ways. Uh, and yeah, like it, is, it has that addicting quality to it where it is. All right, I've died eight times. I know exactly where the enemies are gonna be placed in any given room. I got to make sure that when I enter this room, I dodge left because I know they're going to be at the right and they're going to be aiming this way. Like that's it's you, some of my, it's my, my favorite kind of like arena style gameplay. If you're out of ammo, throw it at the enemy. You stun them. Um, maybe they have a gun. Kick them. They die. Grab their weapon that they dropped on the ground. It's so much so fun. Good. It's so ridiculous. Uh, next up, real quick, I want to talk about Vice Undercover. Vice uh, Undercover. It's spelled Undercover, spelled N D R C V R. Oh, right. Uh, so they can get the the trademark on that one. Um, it well, it's pretty early, um, and they the the day that I played it was the first day they ever revealed the trailer or anything. I just think this one's really cool because it is a paper please type game. Um, I liken it to if Emily is away met um, Overcooked where it's Emily is away in the sense that you are playing this old school 80s computer, um, opening up different apps to do tasks and all that stuff. But there's a timer that you see in the upper right there counting down um, that you have to get a whole bunch of tasks done in that certain time or else you you lose and, and that's the, the end of it. So there's the pressure is on in an overcooked way that is really kind of like, yo, there's a lot of story, there's a lot of stuff I need to take in, but I got to click, I got to move. And you really have to learn the mechanics of the, the different apps and what they all do. Uh, it takes place in alternate history, 1980s Miami. Miami, where the entire um, idea of the game, of the story, is what if Pablo Escobar had access to 90s or 2000s level internet, uh, but back in the 80s, and what would that have done to the drug scene and all the crime scenes out in Miami? And the, the, the story essentially is you play this character that is um, the, the wife of somebody that is about to get busted for a like, multi-million dollar drug bust. And you are essentially sneaking into where one of the people that are doing like detective work on you is going to get caught, like get the get your your partner caught. Uh, and you realize that every day they leave their office for one hour a day at the same time for lunch. So the game takes place each day is one mission. And it's the one hour that you have access to their computer. 
So you're logging onto the mm. computer and kind of like hacking into their email and like using information you get to access other files. It gets very Mission Impossible. There's knock lists. There's all this crazy oh, stuff, Andy. That I was like, yo, this is just cool as all hell. And the um the timing of it all. So it's an hour per day, but the hour is 12 minutes in real time. So mm. you got to move. You got to go. You have to keep checking security cameras because uh, janitors might come by or people that got uh, word that you are doing what you're doing might come in and like with a gun and you uh, have to pull a gun out and make the choice. Do I shoot? Do I not shoot? Is it worth hiding the body? All that stuff. It seems ambitious as hell. It is indie as hell. It is rad as hell. Andy, <laughs> how, how does how do those choices get communicated to you? Is it all just like tech stuff? So, yeah, people on the outside that are essentially uh, old school aiming you um, or, or like emailing you and they're like, here's the mission. Here's what I need from you. But they think a lot of people are emailing the computer thinking that you're the person you're pretending to be. So sorry, you're sorry, getting, sorry. I mean, go for it. I mean, like you as the player, like, are, are you getting text pop ups or is it yeah. like happening? Text like pops ups. OK, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, a lot of a lot of dialogue choice, text pop ups for stuff. But most of it is kind of like um we need to get this guy's address. So it's like, you'll go use an app to get the database app. You find the guy's name and then you link to it. And then there's an address field. You copy that address and you paste it into a different app to send to someone else to get a different mission going. Someone's bank account number. You have to log into to transfer funds to different ways. Like it is ridiculous. And the whole time I was just like, Mike and Nick are going to love this. Like, this is like the most perfect uh, stream game for them i'm very like i'm stoked about it. it they really won me over it was like su it's such a small weird game but like it's cool as hell and i i hope that uh it comes out they were saying next year i hope it hits because i think that this is going to be one of those real niche fun ones for for people to give it a shot uh next up nightingale greg you wanted to talk about a bit yeah, and it's lightning around, so I'll go fast. This is uh, Nightingale is a new shared world survival crafting and building game coming to PC early access in 2022. Uh, this is off their Twitter bio. Uh, it's actually the way it stands out is it's Inflexi Inflexion's game, game's first on one. This is Aaron Flynn's new studio. He used to be over at mm. Bioware and he left. This was a hands off demo, so it was just the game uh, looping footage while we watched and me and Aaron talked about it. And I haven't talked to him in quite some time, so it's good to catch up. And then for him to actually sell me on this game, uh, this is pretty much what one. This is one of the things we were watching, right? It is a Victorian era shared world survival game, right? And it's a crafting thing. And when I read it on paper, survival and crafting, I immediately kind of was like, okay, not going to be a Greg game. Like, you know, Ark isn't my my jam. Rust isn't my jam. I hate that. Like, I don't hate it, but I, crafting and building a base and then sitting there and having to defend it from people is never really what I'm about. Uh, I think this one has a great narrative backbone. It is uh, He was pitching it very much as a story game, right? Like in the early 1500s, uh, fairies that appear, appeared, they taught us the magic of portals. Uh, humans found this, founded this town called Nightingale to study magic. And then in 1889, there's this global cataclysm. Expect, it fucks up the whole portal network. You jump in and kind of like a slider's quantum leap almost, get blasted and don't have the ability to get back to where you were in nightingale so you're trying to get back there to figure it out but of course you have to set up a shop somewhere and get going and so you're playing you're you know obviously fighting off hordes and stuff like this but you're able to set up camp and you know invite your friends into your world and have them hang out with you and live there for a while and figure out what you want to do before you get back to nightingale or whatever but the thing about it is you have these cards right uh that you're earning throughout the game or finding throughout the game that then you can use to open the portals and then go to these new realms and so when you go to a new realm if you wanted to you can move your base there you can set up the base there and be there you're seeing some of the realm stuff here and people coming through Man, and fight with you looked awesome and so, yeah, like it, the, the idea that there's these NPCs that are giving you these quests and these things, it kind of sounds to me like, you know, more of an RPG, but I really fucking like what I saw here and I'm excited to play more of it when it comes out this year on PC. Hell yeah. Another day of the devs want to get, want to give a shout out to is Skim, S C H I M. Uh, you're a little frog that is only able to move if you're popping into different shadows it is a puzzle based game that it has the same kind of isometric camera system that captain toad has um the visual style of it is really really cool really simplistic minimalist where everything's kind of just like the basic like white which is like real simple black outlines and then every Gorgeous. level has like one pop color uh palette that they add to it uh really fun cool stuff real simple never really broke my brain in any way from what i played uh but i really dug it i enjoyed 
enjoyed it. This seems like the type of game that might be a a super fun, super interesting, like three hour experience when all said and done. Uh, that is cute as hell and has a, a ton of really good ideas. But uh, I know this people were a little more torn on this one, but I seem to really dig it. I really, yeah, like, this I really like it. Cool as hell. Yeah. It, I, it, 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 maybe the soundtrack puts it on another echelon. But yeah, this was one of the games that I think during um, Day of the Devs that was easily a standout for me uh, where it's like, I need to play this. This has a really cool concept. And I just appreciate a different, a really different art style. Um, I, I love devs kind of taking chances like that. Uh, I didn't dig it. Uh, I thought I liked it a lot when I saw it in the trailer and then playing it. I was like, Oh, okay. Like this is going to be hard to maintain my attention, even if it is just three hours personally, but good for everybody. What about yeah, I I you the frogs? Mom got divorced. Does Trauma. the dad have a drinking? Does the dad <laughs> frog have a drinking problem? Yep. Yeah, the yeah. dad <laughs> frog. Uh, there was another one that I don't have on the list here, but time flies. Uh, Greg, what what do you think about that one? Another one that I thought during the day of the devs uh, presentation looked really cute and quirky and is, and then I played it and I was like, oh yeah, I would not want to play this beyond this demo I've done. Yeah, I did not like Time Flies at all. I, I, I'm with you where like the idea and the pitch is like, oh, this could be fun. Playing it, I'm like, this it feels a little pointless. And if you miss the pitch, and you're, you're an audio listener, right? It's this black and white game, very minimalist. You are a dot on the screen, which is of course a house fly, and you have. Uh, the life expectancy of a house fly in whatever country you pick to do whatever you want in the house. So there's a you know a to do list that it has a whole bunch of stuff of like you know get drunk, uh, you know go over here, find friends, all these different things. And some of the, the, the it's almost it's like a puzzler when you start it because you don't know what to do. And some of them it's like oh this is a I, I when I was I forget which one it was that I saw I'll start a revolution. I was like that sounds like it's going to be weird or hard. Am I getting a bunch of flies? And then when I found the solution, I was like oh that's kind of cute. Yeah, but yeah. in general, I was like cool. This is good enough for me. It reminds me a bit of a title goose game, except he plays a fly. And yeah, the art style, uh, the art style is very like hand drawn, like you know, uh, like almost coloring book, like mm -hmm. black and MS white. Paint. MS, yeah, MS Paint is actually the perfect way to put it. Yeah, and like I, I, I didn't dig it that much either to play. I did like looking at it, but also like sure. you know, for a, a lot of these games, we didn't have much time to to play these ones. And I, um, it, there was kind of like a rotating demo station, and I was playing Shim or Skim right before this one, the sh the Frog Shadow one. And I was actually having a blast with that one. I was like, oh, this is great. Like, I, my puzzle platforming brain is really it really digging this, and I didn't want to stop playing it. And then they put me on to Time Flies. I started playing, and like four five minutes in, I was like, all right, I think I'm done here. I think I played yeah. what I needed to play, and I just walked off. <laughs> Uh, then next up, we got a double whammy of similar games. We have a little to the left, Greg. Yeah, a little left is the one you saw on Day of the Devs. That's a puzzle game about tidying up the house. And so, like, it was the one. Like, we I got to play it. It's cute. It's fun. You know, there's 75 puzzles at launch. Uh, there's uh, different things to do. One of the ones I had is you know, it starts a little to the left. It's like a framing joke, and there it was. You know, get the frame centered. Great. It reminds me a little bit of like a, a WarioWare, or a Brain Age, right? You're seeing keys get organized by size here. It's about tidying it up. But as you also see there, there's stars. Meaning, uh, there's stars for when you finish a puzzle. And I think it's easy to go in like I did and be like, oh, it's about speed. In the fruit one you just saw, that was the one I played and I only got one star out of two. And I was like, what the hell? And they're like, well, there's actually alternate solutions to do things. And you have to go in there. And again, there's going to be the in your face, as you just saw there, straighten this out, uh, get the the spoons in the right order of, you know, smallest to largest or largest to smallest. Sure. But then there's some, there'll be little things to think about more. And I don't want to ruin the, the fruit uh, puzzle uh, thing in case you get it, but I thought it was really clever. One of the things I think is the most clever about this, a little to the left, again, in the brain age way, is they're doing a thing called the daily tidy. And it's going to be a daily puzzle that gets served to you. Uh, everyone will get the same like genre of puzzle. So if it was the fruit one, you get the fruit one or whatever. But the solutions would be different for everybody. So it wouldn't be like you're getting the exact same puzzle. Somebody could sp spoil like a Wordle, but you'd have the same. If if Wordle was a puzzle, you'd all have a Wordle, not the same Wordle. Then. I didn't get to, uh, to try this one. What's up with the cat that was in the trailer just now? Did you get to play around with that? So it's well, their it's cat. Yeah. The owners have a cat. And um, that, that's kind of their whole idea here is like, you know, how anytime they try to tidy stuff in their house, their cat fucks it up. And so you see here, like the cat kind of will mess things up. So it adds a little bit of difficulty where it's not just puzzles at certain points. Like it, it felt kind of random with the demo I played, but uh, every like third or fourth random uh, puzzle, the cat would do something. And it's like, oh, shit, I need to do this quickly. And it just adds a little bit of fun. That looks really cool. Yeah, it was fun. I like it a lot. I'm looking forward to it. 
Uh, and then the next one um, that I played that I actually really, really dug was called Birth. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the reasons I, I dug it so much is I got a little bit more. I had, I got two demo times with it as opposed to the one of us shifting around really quick. So I played a little left for maybe five minutes, but I actually got about 10 minutes with Birth. It's a very similar idea where you're kind of just figuring out these WarioWare-esque puzzles. Uh, but this one's dark as shit. Uh, I described it as weird in a good way, um, where it's more of a, of a story of somebody that's like very lonely and sad um and you kind of explore this city and i was often really wowed by the scope of it where it's not just random puzzle after random puzzle there's like uh if you can see the bottom left there there's like a, a city that you can click on and then a backpack in the backpack there's different things that you're gathering to solve other puzzle puzzles later the city you go to and it's like this really really intricate world where you get to click on into different buildings you go to the coffee shop you go to the bookstore uh wherever where each one has its own set of puzzles and some of them work where the puzzles are uh, all in the one place, but some of them are things that you're collecting to go to the city to bring them to a different place to solve yep. puzzles elsewhere. Um, really, really damn cool. And again, weird as hell, but I just, I love the the aesthetic of it all. And it, it it's it's creepy as shit. Bless. Yeah. The phys- oh, sorry. Uh, quick question. Did they talk about platforms for a birth and a, a little to the left? Yeah, can, they did. I kind of want to play those on mobile. Those look like they'd be really dope ass mobile games. Or like I was Switch playing- games. I was playing Birth on a PC, um, so I, I don't know, but I, I was really digging it. Okay. I mean, that's a Steam Deck joint for me then. And I, yeah, I do believe... It's coming in August. I do believe for the other one who's not... And I always talk so many times and my name's escaping me, but the one we just talked about, a little to the left, Earth? I'm pretty sure... No, a little to the left for me, sorry, that I was just talking about, I believe yeah. is PC and uh, Switch. That's, yeah, they, they have a Switch. Uh, they have it on Switch here at the end of their trailer. Gotcha. Uh, but yeah, Birth was really was really fun, and it was very similar, but it was also very different. And again, I think it's worth pointing out that the whole point here is that you're so lonely, you're constructing a creature from spare bones and organs found in the world. So that's what Peter you're doing Frank. is you're going through and doing these physical based puzzles and getting things and moving around. You're trying to assemble a person or a thing. And then uh, the next game I want to talk about has a, a similar vibe of, of sadness being dealt with in a cool gameplay mechanic uh, is Desta, The Memories Between. This is from the Monument Monument Valley team. It's a Netflix produced game mm. or Netflix published game. But what's interesting about this one is I thought that meant you play it on Netflix because the whole Netflix games thing. No, it's not. That's not it at all. This is a uh, it's it's on PC or it's on a uh, yeah PC and uh, iPad is where I was playing it on, and it's a turn based tactics game, um, kind of similar to a. Um, Mario plus rabbits kingdom battle type uh, battle system uh, combined with the physics of like dodgeball, almost Peggle like where you're pulling back the ball to attack and you're throwing it at people. Uh, The battles are you dealing with what you wish you had said in conversations. So it's somebody that's like really the main character Desta. uh, They're looking into themselves and like being like, Oh man, like why'd I say it this way to, to my former partner or why'd I do that at the grocery store or whatever. And the battles are them kind of like trying to come up with the, the, if I could live back that moment differently, this is how I would do it differently. And that's all backed up with like story and dialogue choices and stuff. And I thought it was pretty damn cool. And it definitely looks beautiful. Yeah. The art style is gorgeous for this one. This is one that I got to demo as well. And as the developer was explaining, explaining it to me, it was one of those, it was one of those, you know, fun ones where I sat down to do the demo and uh, like, I didn't know what the game was. Like Greg had already scheduled everything. And as I sat down, I was like, this is not my kind of game. I do not like any sort of like strat- strategy, like Mario and Rabbids, like that kind of gameplay doesn't really do it for me. The more the dev explained it, the more I was like, oh shit. I can kind of dig this, right? And especially playing it off of the iPad where it is, you know, you do the thing, you set up exactly like, um, or you figure out exactly who you want to hit. And it is dodge, dodgeball gameplay where you are doing the Angry Birds, you pull back on a character, angle them, and hopefully you can get the angle right to then release. And then the, the dodgeball will hit that character and you use that to affect damage. Uh, looks like it re- look, looks really cool. Uh, seems like it seems like it's pretty fun. And like as a Netflix game, like this is beyond what I even thought that like Netflix would even be doing. Um, it's interesting again that's from the monument valley team because like that kind of takes me back to like monument valley and house of cards now that kind of comes full circle i'm sure that's huh, they probably interesting talks yeah right uh but yeah like it's one i'm looking forward to um the next one that we all played together uh that we might end on actually is glitch busters um that was a, it was a small game for skybound games and uh it is really quirky um that the idea and concept of it is it's a four-player multiplayer uh third person kind of like action game where you're working as a team it's very ghostbusters esque in ways where you're going through cleaning some shit up but the things you're cleaning up are internet-based stuff so the whole game is like you're jumping around on like uh 
app icon images and, and things like that. It's so like you're kind of in the internet, really cute, really colorful, definitely a family friendly thing. Uh, the one thing, my biggest takeaway from this is how much it made me realize I want a modern uh, Ratchet and Clank all for one type game <laughs> where it's like uh, play with your friends online and you know it's a third person shooter where you're all working together to, to fuck around in a fun platforming element the gimmick here is uh, everything's about magnets you can jump on top of each other and kind of extend your reach and stuff it was fun I don't think this is anything that the three of us are like yo game of the year but it was like ah, it's kind of a cool idea the art style is so chaotic in this one. That's that was my big takeaway. Is I, as we were playing it, my like there's so much going on on screen in terms of like you're playing in a digital world and everything is everything is inspired by the internet. And so like you'll be wa j jumping on platforms and the platforms will be icons from like your phone, right? Like here's the Wi-Fi icon, here's the fucking phone icon. You're hopping on those boxes uh, and like a lot, a, a, like a, there's like a lot of emoji shit going on. Like it is legit if you jumped into a modern iPhone uh, as a digital world as a platforming level um, and. And there's, again, so much going on that I don't, I honestly don't know if I like the art style or not. Like, I kind of want to see more of what are the different theming for different levels and does that stuff come together? Because for the one level we played, I was like, oh, this is, I, you could tell that they went for it, right? They have a very specific vision on what they want the game to uh, to look like. But my, my eyes just felt like they were being, being attacked at times <laughs> by how yeah. much there was going on. It there was very a lot. 3D in a lot of sections, but then there was a clip there that Barry just showed where it was 2D, sort of a side-scrolling type thing? Is it, are there just like different Mario Party type levels? No, it was 3D. It was all 3D. There, 3D, are 2D, there was there. a 2D section we played that was us going through. Like, oh, a, that's right. Yeah, like that a, wasn't a linear. Fun. Yeah, that was not, really not bad. Really. <laughs> that, and I think that honestly, I think that was like a Mario Party style. Like, oh, that was a separate gameplay game. mode. Yeah, it was a separate mode. Yeah, it seems like the main bulk of this game is third person co-op shooting. And it, yeah. I, I had a fine time with it. I thought it was pretty cool. It's, any final say, games go for it no don't worry we're done <laughs> <laughs> is there any other final game you want to talk about that we didn't mention that we played i played a little, a little bit of jojo's bizarre adventure all-star battle uh, r is what i think it is uh that's a fighting game that is jojo's bizarre adventure it's like a um a revamp of the one that came out about a decade ago They're, they mentioned how it's a new art style new mechanics new all this stuff I had a pretty good time with it. Usually I don't fuck with the anime Bandai, Bandai Namco published games. This one is a bit more on the side of a Budokai style game where it is 2D, but you can kind of shift around in the 3D space. Uh, and I had fun. It played a little bit more like a Street Fighter than a Naruto uh, Ultimate Ninja Storm. But it was also one of the ones where in a, in the same event as Street Fighter, everybody was flocking to Street Fighter. Nobody I talked to was really talking about JoJo. But, you know, I, it seemed like a pretty fun time. I actually would be down to play a little bit of it when it comes out. Uh, and with that, for anyone wondering where our Street Fighter VI uh, impressions are, that is actually on our Capcom uh, showcase reaction video that we did. It's labeled. You'll see it. It has uh, Street Fighter VI. We played it as the thumbnail. So you can go check that video out as well. Uh, and with that, that's the end of this episode of Kind of Funny Games Cast. We're about to do the Patreon exclusive post show for people over at patreon.com slash kindoffunnygames. But until next time, I love you all.